Okay, so um, we're talking about um, data sets uh, for the uh, design of algorithms in object recognition. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time uh, last time describing ImageNet um, and the associated uh, challenge that, uh, that was run uh, for many years, right? And as uh, we're discussing on Tuesday, the first few years had uh, very few people participating in them, right? So in 2010, you see here, there were probably about 30 uh, participants. By 2011, that had probably dropped by about, I don't know, 10, 15 participants, uh, only to recover slightly or um, not fully by 2012. The main reason for this is that object recognition is a very hard problem, right? Let's face it. So most of the algorithms, not all, but most of the algorithms that were participating these first years, uh, three years, uh, were based on the algorithms that we have described in class, right? Um, they were based on extracting some low-level features right, of the image doing, uh, with the low-level vision algorithms that we have described. These low-level features are used to define a feature space where um, you, you may actually use mid-level vision as well uh, to organize the feature somewhere, uh, somehow, before you construct that feature space. But once you have that feature space and use a classifier from machine learning, typically, to do classification. Or if you use shape-based methods, you can, do, you can use one of these uh, metrics that we have defined to determine whether two shapes correspond to the same object category or class, right? And these algorithms work relatively okay when the data is um, collected in control environments, right? Or the data that you have to classify does, n is, is not too, does not have large differences between images of the same object, right? But if I give you an image of a book where I show you the cover of the book and an image of the book with the book opened, right? and an image of the book where you only see uh, the side of the book, um, then these three images are extremely different, yet they correspond to the same category, right? And unless the algorithm knows this, then that's just not gonna happen. Uh, there's just no way that you can do recognition of objects. And that was what's happening, right? Now I wanna emphasize that even from the first years, there were people working with all the methods that we have introduced, including deep learning, right? So it's not that people were not trying with deep learning, they were. But as we have said many times, why do we design the deep learning algorithms in the way we design them these days? Because after many trials and error in many data sets, including ImageNet, Pascal, VOC, and others, uh, those were the networks that finally made it work, right? Now, if someone else had been working on some other type of computer vision algorithm, one of the computer vision algorithms that we have described in class, that had achieved the best results in these problems, now we'll all be working on that other type of algorithm or algorithms, right? But what happened was that eventually someone had a breakthrough, right? with what we now call the AlexNet, and achieved not only the best results to date, but a significant improvement on the best results to that point. And that's where people got very interested then again around 2013, 2014, is when there was this resurgence of interest in, that comp in this competition, ImageNet uh, competition, because of that. Because now we had an algorithm that could perform really well on that data set. And everyone started working on this, and then there was an explosion every time it worked better and better and better, right? Um, so um, this is the classification error on the, uh, I've, that's, oh, that's the image classification uh, task in the LVSVCRC. And um, you can see by 2020, uh, 2010, excuse me, it was about 20% error. And 
by 2013, it had dropped to 12%, which is a big drop. I mean, don't get me wrong, right? This is a huge drop. But then in a single year, it dropped from 0.12, right, so 12%, to 7%. That's a significant drop. That's when people started taking notice, right? Uh, that's a very low um, error rate. And you have to check the references that are given uh, down here in the slide. I believe that that's still, i um, pretty sure, that's still top five. Remember, top five classification error, right? It means that your class, the correct class, is in within the first five guesses that your algorithm makes, right? Not the top guess, just uh, top one, would be top one. So um, here's what happened, right? Um, in 2010, or thereabouts, 2010, 2011, people were using deep learning, but they mostly use what we would now call shallow networks. One of the big reasons this happened was because computers were not as powerful as today's computers, right? It's not that people are like, hmm, I only want to use four layers in my graph, right? My architecture, the topology of my network. No, that's not what happened, is that it's just technology wasn't ready. But there was another reason for this, um, or several more reasons, right? So other minor reasons, no one had ever done it. Um, you know, uh, no one had had such large data sets ever available uh, before. So people were not used to doing these things. But there was another big reason why people were not doing it. And that is because training large, uh, uh, large networks with more hidden layers is really hard. And it's not been until recently that normalization methods uh, like batch normalization have been developed and have allowed us to train networks with more layers, okay? Now, I'm not going to teach this here because it'd be out of context, but most of you or some, many of you at least have taken my machine learning course. And if not, you can go to the video lectures as always and check all the types of, l types of layers that you, you can use to design these deep neural networks, and the type of normalizations, the uh, variations of the training uh, methods, right, uh, that people use, or the tricks, rather, that people use to train these networks. So one of the things that works really well when you train these networks is that at every pass of the gradient descent, right, every uh, pass of the backpropagation algorithm, you are going to multiply the effect on each node of the graph with probability 50%, 0.5, with probability 0.5 that that, net, that that node of the network is going to be active or meaningful or not, meaning that it's going to be affected by the gradient descent changes or it's not going to be affected, right? So basically rendering half of the network or turning half of the network off every time that you compute gradient descent and you apply gradient descent. That sounds really silly, but that makes it much easier to train deep networks, right? And there are many tricks like this. As I said, normalization plays a big role. One of the problems with the backpropagation algorithm that we have not discussed in this class is that when you pass, when you compute the gradient, in the first layer, you get some useful values, right? And then you backpropagate this, right, with the chain rule. You backpropagate this to the second layer, and then you have to take the derivative there again, and those values decrease in amplitude, right? And then when you go to the third layer, they decrease even more. And eventually, you just dissipate, right? And there's very little effect on nodes that are in the early layers of the network because you're going backwards. So you need to normalize these, uh, these uh, uh, weights and uh, these passes of the gradient as you go back such that you can train the whole network rather than just the, the latest uh, or the final layers of it, right? Also, uh, having um, the last layers as fully connected layers, remember, tends to make things worse, right? Because obviously more connections means more weights, which means more parameters, right? So this is important. So at this point, uh, people were using like, you know, four or five layers, 
uh, maybe three, very sh shallow network. Uh, when there was a huge drop, look at the drop here, although I don't think that this, oh yeah, this is AlexNet. This drop, right, this huge, huge drop that happened here is a 9% drop, which is insane, right? That's when AlexNet um, was first uh, published, right? Or first come into our frame of view. And that's when people realize, oh, if I start using more layers, like eight layers, I'm doing better. Uh, people with eight layers still could improve that even further. So now we're going from 25 to 11% error, which is huge, incredibly huge. And then this is where people start saying, well, if I could do that better with eight, what's going to happen with 19? And you know what? They did better. And what happens if I use 22? Eh, you do a little better. And what happens if I use 152 layers? That's no joke. Uh, and yeah, you do better, but you see that it gets to a point that the number of layers has to increase dramatically to get a small improvement, right? Obviously, that's because we are already at a very low rate. So obviously, if you we were probably at a much higher rate or in a much more difficult problem, that would be a much larger decrease, right? in performance, but there, is no there, there isn't a linear relationship between the number of layers and the improvement in performance, at least in this type of data sets that we know of, there's a huge decrease in the error rate for adding just a few more layers at the beginning, and then there's a very small decrease for adding many more layers later on, right? Now, I have to emphasize that what people have been claiming, or many people have claimed, and they are probably right, is that in the first years of the competition, right, so 2011 when this algorithm won, uh, 2012 when AlexNet won the competition, and then in 2013 when ZF, which is another network that was an extension of uh, AlexNet and other networks of the time, uh, one, that these improvements were pretty reliable, that we believe that this was something that mattered, that made a difference, that, was, that, that has, although we don't know exactly what, has some theoretical value behind it, right? But it got to a point where you're starting designing uh, these deep networks, deep, deep networks like VGG, I'll describe it in a minute, GoogleNet later on, um, and ResNet, uh, in 2015 that it's questionable whether these are actually improving over the results of the previous algorithms and these are just probably totally overfitting, right? And by overfitting, we don't mean that they overfit to the training data. We mean that people have worked so hard to make these algorithms work on this specific data set for this specific competition that these algorithms just specifically overfitted to that particular type of data and that particular type of challenge, right? Um, I, have, um, I have run a competition the last several years, as I've mentioned, called EmotionNet, which uh, tests uh, the detection of facial muscle articulations. And people that have tested these same networks and extensions of these networks have been unable to achieve good results on that competition. Yes, it's, a more, it's probably a very challenging problem, much more challenging problem. Well, I would say much more challenging, but more challenging problem because more abstract. But it's not fundamentally different than the images that you have in ImageNet. And yet these algorithms are not performing well or well enough uh, in that other problem, right? So it is questionable how much progress this is and is most likely overfitting uh, for these others. So I want you to keep this in mind um, as we describe this algorithm. Yeah, question. Are these errors, um, errors given on like sequestered? Yeah, that's on sequestered data for the competition. Yes. They change it every year. That's correct. Yeah. Now, I don't know if they still change it now. I don't think they do. Uh, so as I mentioned last time, uh, the, the competition has ended. 
uh, and Kegel, which is a company that started uh, out of Australia, and then Google bought it, and um, I think they may be now in California somewhere, uh, or maybe they're still in Australia. But Kegel, um, and you have the links in Canvas, by the way, or the YouTube video, um, they run many, many competitions like this in computer vision. And they have the data set there, and then you can go there and submit your results, right? You can apply your algorithm to the results. Uh, and they keep a tabs on who is doing or how well people are doing over the years, right? And I don't know if that new, that latest testing set changes every year. That I don't know. Uh, we'd have to ask you, but um, I would I suspect that they don't. Or if they do, they change it minimally. That's my guess, but I don't know. OK, so um, this is a deep network that did not win, that was actually not performing, performing OK, but not great, supervision in 2012, right? So there were already deep networks that were being developed at the time. Uh, by 2014, there were uh, these other networks that uh, people were using. They were performing uh, really well. Um, these are the images that these networks find the easiest to classify and the ones that find the hardest to classify. So let's see. They find it easiest to, see, to say that this is a red fox. I mean, yeah, that's an easy image, right? Uh, actually, this is surprising. But tiger, that's not a surprising result, right? Or uh, ibex, not a surprising result, uh, et cetera, right? I mean, obviously, you can see that the images that the networks find easy to classify are actually easy, right? They are the note, most importantly, that the object of interest is typically at the very center of the image, right? That makes it much easier for these algorithms. Now, um, you know, muzzle. I mean, obviously, that is, you can understand why this might be hard, right? There are three of them. They're one on top of the other, different colors, uh, creating shadows that make the problem difficult. Um, I mean, hook. If you tell me that they have to say hook here, I'll say, yeah, OK, I get it. But if I have to come up with this, right? From not, this is a hard one, uh, yeah. Um, hatches, obviously. Um, uh, there's a water bottle here. Okay, yeah, there are many water bottles, right? Yeah, this is hard. So, um, I mean, obviously, object recognition is hard. That's a point, right? Um, so these networks find these uh, objects difficult, not surprisingly. Um, there are many others, right? I mean, can you design a computer vision algorithm that gives me a list of all the objects that you see in that image? Right? Absolutely not. Not even close, right? We're not even close to this. That would be insane. Um, so let's uh, review very quickly what the basic um, or the most famous deep neural networks, and this is not an exhaustive um, description or overview of the you know, of the most important deep neural networks, but just a, a small sample of some that performed really well on that particular competition. So the first one, as we said, is this one. The reason you see it separated into two uh, separate paths is because at the time, that was the biggest network, this one, that you could fit in a GPU, OK? The, the biggest GPU in the market. So they, f they had two GPUs. And they had this in one GPU and the same thing on another GPU running in parallel, right? That's how they managed. Um, so this network had eight, eight layers um, that included five convolutional layers. Remember, one of the findings that was surprising from the ImageNet competition is that the more convolutional layers that you had, remember, convolution is just a linear filter like we saw in 5460. There's nothing else, right? I mean, you have a tensor, this is your image, right, that has uh, the window of the, the image is p by q, and then three in depth, which is RGB, right? And you apply a convolution to that window with some kernel, right? That's it. 
and you define how many kernels and therefore how many convolutions, at which sizes, you define the stride rate, remember, which is at each pixel or every two pixels or every four pixels and so on, all these details. And what was surprising was that doing convolutions not just once, but doing a convolution and then another convolution on top of the convolution and then another convolution on top of the convolution and then another convolution on top of the convolution, seem to yield better results. Why? Nobody really knows yet, right? <laughs> now, we also found that because of this difficulty of training and making these algorithms work, uh, people also discovered that applying a convolutional layer and then a max pooling uh, layer where you compute the max of a window, right? Remember? and then doing another convolution there, max pooling, that these things tend to work better. So these things obviously were replicated. Um, so convolutions, and then at the end, three fully connected layers, right, at the very end. Um, the last layer had a thousand nodes because with the softmax that we have introduced before, because there were a thousand categories in the, um, in the um, competition. Okay. Now, what some people did uh, originally in these networks that we saw in low-level vision is that you trained us to classify the 1,000 classes in ImageNet, and then once they were done, these two or three last layers, they would just chop, chop them out, right? You take them out, and then those uh, uh, nodes in the now last layer would, be, would define your feature space, right? your low-level features that we call deep features, right? And then use any other machine learning algorithm on that feature space to do classification, okay? Use a support vector machine or a discriminant analysis algorithm or some regression or uh, manifold learning, right? Any other method. Okay, I've given you here some details of the convolution just to, excuse me, of the layers, just to give you an idea of what AlexNet looked like. So it had, um, the first convolutional layer had filters uh, with 224 by 224 by three input images with 96 kernels. Uh, the size of each kernel was 11 by 11 by three. Uh, the stride rate was four. The second convolutional layer it uh, takes us input the previous ones uh, after normalization and pulling and outputs the first convolutional layer, uh, excuse me, and then applies 256 kernels of size 5 by 5 by 48 and so on, right? So you see all the details. And the question is why this? And the answer is because they try many things and that worked, right? There's just no other uh, way to describe this. And that's why there is nothing else like practice because when you practice, practice, practice with these things on multiple problems, you get an intuition of why things work or don't work on the specific types of data, and then you become invaluable, right, at designing these things for uh, these companies that are interested in this. Uh, as I said, uh, people usually apply dropout, AlexNet applied dropout, which is that you apply this probability of 0.5 to determine whether uh, each node has to be active or not during training, and then you apply the same probability during the forward pass for testing, right? Because you've only used the, the nodes, each node, 50% uh, of the time. Uh, so this is training. Um, this is the classical equation here, right, that we have seen before, right, um, with uh, certain uh, velocity, uh, the change of the weights, the derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters, and so on, right? So we have seen that before. And this um, is the output of the, this ones here, of the 96 convolutional kernels of size 11 by 11 by 3, uh, learned by the first convolutional layer on the 224 by 224 by 3 input images, okay? And so remember that this is similar to what we had seen before when we we're talking about low-level vision on the features, right? Um, and then here are the results. So you see that they could achieve that 17% classification error that I mentioned. So it went from, what was it, uh, 26 to 17, right? From one year to the next. Um, but still the top one error was still 37, 
percent, right? This is huge. No, this um, all right. Uh, as I said, people started going deeper and deeper in convolutions as computers and GPUs improved. Uh, so this um, is the introduction of the so-called inception layer. And the inception, la inception layer works like this. Uh, this is, let's look at the naive inception layer first. So you take the input of the previous layer, that could be the image in the first layer, or it could just be the output of the previous layer. And then you do a one by one convolution, a three by three convolution, a five by five convolution, and a three by three max pulling. Okay? These are, this is a new layer, but these are independent computations. They're running parallel. And then you apply some filter to concentrate, to do concentration of all these different results into a single output. Okay? Um, the variant of this is to do a one by one convolution followed by a three by three, a one by one followed by a five by five, and a three by three max plane followed by a one by one. The reason for these one by one convolutions here is to do dimensionality reduction, right? To, to simplify as much as possible the, the uh, previous information, this previous result that you have, okay? All right. Um, now, GoogleNet, it's based on this inception type of layers, just many inception layers repeated over and over and over again. And this is the type of, here that you have right in this column, the type of layer that you have, the patch and the stride size, the output size, uh, the depth, right, how many layers, the number of one by one, uh, convolutions, a number of three by three, three by three, uh, five by five, and so on, right? So you get an idea. And this is the number of parameters that you have in each of these layers, right? Okay. And you can see that, for example, you start with a convolutional layer, then a max pooling, then a convolution, then a max pooling, as I was saying, and then you start with inception, inception, max pooling, inception, inception layer, right? And so on. Um, and after a while, you do a max pulling, and then an inception, inception, and then an average pulling, and then which an average pulling would be similar to the max pulling, but instead of using the max operator, you use the max com uh, uh, computation, right? A max operator. Um, then uh, you also do drop out. Uh, you use a linear uh, layer. Uh, remember, a linear would just be uh, that your f of x is. Uh, x times w, right, w, the normal of the, the hyperplane, and plus d, d, the offset of the hyperplane, right? And then you apply a softmax, right? And this is the number of parameters, so start counting, right? This is a lot of thousands. <laughs> That's a lot of thousands. You end up with millions and millions of parameters in these networks, right? That's what makes it uh, really hard to train. Um, and look at the size here of the output tensors, right? So these are huge tensors too, uh, right here, especially at the beginning. And then once you have a tensor, even these ones are one by one by 1,024, right? If this uh, tend to, since many of these, not necessarily in Google Net, but in many networks, this could be uh, fully connected, that creates a lot of uh, parameters as well, right? That corresponds to a lot of parameters. And that's what it looks like, right? So this is the Google Net. Now, I have had to put it horizontal instead of vertically uh, because otherwise it doesn't fit. So this is the image, right? And then you do convolutional, max pulling, I think this is, and then normalization maybe in convolutional, and so on, right? And these are the inception modules, right? These ones that I have indicated here uh, on that Google Net. And note, that then once in a while, you have a, a set of layers here that gives me an output, and another set of layers that give me an output, and this is the final output, right? And the reason people do this is because then they test how well this output does versus how well this output does how, versus how well this output does. And in, time, in, the, in the testing phase, you may actually want to do a linear combination of these outputs, 
for to determine your classification accuracy, right? And you could have just an average of these three different outputs, or you could have a weighted average where the uh, estimate of how well of these outputs works would be the weight for uh, the the um, for, for the influence in the final decision, and so on. Yeah. Uh, then in 2015, um, Microsoft came out with this other type of module, uh, which is uh, given here, where, which is called a residual uh, learning module. And this is nothing else than this function right here, right? So you have uh, f of x, with the parameters w, right, plus x. And plus x means that, remember, we have always said f of x equals y. Now I'm going to say that f of x plus x is equal to y. And this corresponds to nothing else than passing x, shown here, through the layers of the network, but also not passing it through these layers of the networks, such that if these layers the idea is, anyways, that if these layers are not useful during training, are found not useful for your task, that these weights are, can be set to zero. And yet, you do not lose the input or previous layers information because they are skipped to the next layer. And see how this works? Um, so anyways, you repeat this many, many, many times. There are many versions of ResNet, ResNet 50, is 50 layers. Uh, ResNet 154 that we've mentioned before is 154 layers and so on, right? Um, so here is a, a description of the type of, uh, it's got 152, not 154, my, my bad. Um, this is a description of the different type of uh, output sizes, layers, and the types of um, tensors and convolutions that are used in this and the flops that are required for this. And look at, uh, note that this is 10 to the 9, right? So actually be 10 to the 10 uh, in this particular case. And these are the top uh, one errors and the top five errors. And VGG, which I have not discussed, um, but it was one of the first deep, deep networks, and then Google Net, um, they were at about 9% classification error for top five. And now ResNet, the ResNet 50 means 50 layers, it's about six. Uh, 101 layers, it's six. And 152, it's 5.7. So you see, there's no huge difference between this, right? And I would even argue that the only small difference that you see, it's just overfitting to that particular problem. There's just not, not a significant uh, change. Now, if you look at the top one, right, you see that even more clearly. The top one is 22.8 for 50 layers versus 21.4 for 152. So basically, you've improved by 0.4 by adding 102 layers. Uh, probably insignificant, probably not statistically significant, right? So most likely um, mo adding more layers after that is not helping at this stage, right? Now, I have to say there are many variants now that have been proposed of, on ResNet that work a little better on this particular problem, right? So maybe those uh, have, um, are, are better suited to have more layers, but not the original one in this particular problem. Okay, um, this is a comparison of, as I said, supervision that was a deep neural network in 2012 that didn't perform especially well uh, in that competition, but um, it was a deep neural network with seven layers, right? Versus uh, Google Net, when Google Net won uh, the competition, or was second, I forget if it was first or second that year, that already had 22 layers versus Microsoft's, uh, Microsoft's ResNet when they won uh, that had 152 layers, right? So you can see that progression, that super quick progression on the number of layers that uh, these networks started using. And now it is not uncommon for problems 
more, for more complicated problems like in self-driving cars to have many multiple GPUs working in tandem with this network subdivided into many, many GPUs and working in parallel to try to solve problems with many, many, many layers, right? And there is a rule of thumb that says more layers usually lead to better results. But as I said earlier, it is not a linear gain, right? Uh, it gets to a point, uh, very quickly you get to a point, you know, after probably 10, 20 layers, that adding more layers just improving the results marginally if they need to improve the results. Um, as I said, there are many variants of uh, the ResNet. Uh, here I have given you just a set of uh, a, a quick summary of the different layers that uh, people have tried, or different modules rather, that people have tried. Um, so uh, you could add uh, some uh, batch normalization, a ReLU, and a batch normalization, uh, and then do the addition, or you could do just batch normalization, ReLU, and then addition, or you could do batch normalization, ReLU, the weights obviously, batch normalization, ReLU, and then the addition, right? So there are all these variants that people have tried. Um, this one is called pre-activation. There are people that claim that this works better. Um, there's some, some data that seems to suggest this for ImageNet um, and so on. Okay? This is what batch normalization is. As I said, I cover all these things in detail in the machine learning course. So um, if you haven't taken that course, take it uh, next time that it's being offered or look at the YouTube videos. Um, but basically what you are normalizing here is you normalize your, your data with respect to the mean and the standard deviation, right? So that your x and y, you see your x, it's uh, mean and mean, um, excuse me, mean normalized and variance normalized, okay? So norm mean normalized uh, data and that by that uh, token, every layer is treated equally because the weights are um, half in the back propagation have the same magnitude, okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, these are results on ResNet 1001. Uh, I'm actually impressed. Someone actually designed the ResNet with 1001. <laughs> uh, um, I I believe, if I remember correct, I don't remember this, but I think that that might be the number of parameters that uh, they need to estimate, which is absolutely ridiculous. And then again, right, look from 164 to 101, 1001, not a big difference, right? <laughs> it's not, not a huge difference in performance, and these are on much smaller data sets, um, obviously. And this is a graph. I like this graph because it illustrates the evolution of the steam neural network since uh, 2012, uh, 2012, 2013, when people really started working on this. And as you see, AlexNet is down here. Um, in the x-axis, you have the number of operations that are required to uh, process, to train uh, this network. And on the y-axis, the top one accuracy in percentage, okay, on ImageNet. And then you see the top one for AlexNet was probably around 54, 55%. Um, and by the way, this size, uh, just shown here, right, it's the size of the network, right, the size of the number of parameters of that network. And then you see that you can simplify these networks uh, quite a bit and improve as you improve the classification accuracy very rapidly, right? But then it gets to a point where you have to start increasing the number of parameters again, right? And you get to rest nets here where the number of parameters has a exponential, almost exponential increase from these tiny ones that you have here, right? For a, a small gain. So you see this logarithmic type of function, right? Uh, or progression that, uh, that we have seen in the community. And these are the VGG networks that I have not talked about, which is absolutely huge. Okay. Now you have to be very careful because remember, with a hyperplane, uh, so if we do linear lists of squares, 
we are estimating a hyperplane, right? That's what we do with PCA and all the other algorithms that we've, we've described with that applies that uses linear least square. With hyperplane, you have the normal of the vector, which the number of parameters there, it's exactly the number of dimensions of your feature space, right? Plus the offset, right? If there is an offset, uh, which is also the number of dimensions, right? So unless your feature space is huge, which they don't tend to be very large in general, right? I mean, they could be in the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, rarely in the millions, right? The number of parameters is not that large. But here, if the number of parameters is 155 million, then the thing is that you can define a manifold, right, a nonlinear manifold, instead of a hyperplane, that basically is deformed precisely to map every single training data that you give it, right? So that's what overfitting means, that you precisely adapt your function, right, your manifold, this is the function f that we're training, exactly to the data that you are working with, right? Um, so yeah, that makes it work for that particular data. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will generalize later on to other problems, right? Um, so basically these networks are so massive that they can learn anything you feed them because they can deform that manifold as much as they want to adapt to whatever data you're giving them, okay? And that's gonna be a problem that we'll talk in our last lecture in more detail. Okay, this is in comparison to the accuracy, the top one accuracy. Um, another criticism of this, because, I mean, look at the size of these networks, right? and the number of parameters that they have. Um, remember that you need to train this in GPUs, right? There's no other, I mean, if you wanna train this in a CPU, good luck. <laughs> You're gonna, we're gonna be here for many years, right? Um, so you need to train this with GPUs. There's been a strong criticism in uh, recent years that um, this is creating much more of a carbon footprint than if you use your car for all your adult life, all of it. Just turning one of these networks causes much more carbon monoxide to be released in the environment because electricity is gen generally uh, created by burning carbon uh, the, than anything else. So uh, there is a big push in the community to simplify these networks as much as possible. Now, training them, it's uh, still tricky. Um, many big companies are actually going uh, solar and wind powered because of this, because they are cognizant of this problem. Um, now, after training, one of the things that you can do to simplify these networks is to chop them out. And what we have found is that if you just eliminate, you just delete 30, 40, even 50% of the nodes at random, the classification accuracy of the network doesn't drop that much. It drops, but it doesn't drop by a huge margin. And yet you have reduced the size of the network by about half, half which is huge, right? So anyways, I just want you to be uh, aware of that, that the amount of, um, of computations that these networks require have a cost, right? And that cost uh, has to be considered. Uh, people have also combined the residual module of ResNet that I've mentioned with the inception module of the Google Net, right? And shown that you can get better results with combining the two ideas. That's not a big surprise, right? So this is, um, let's see, this is the result with inception version three, uh, the result of um, inception version four, and this is inception plus ResNet. And you know, you get a slightly better, but not significantly so. Um, this is from Kegel's website. And these are the results from June 2015 to December of this year, which 
I'm not sure how they can have that. <laughs> it's only November. Okay. Uh, let's say November is probably here, right? Which is this. Okay. Um, so November of this year, um, and these are the top one accuracies, right? So it's about 80% here. And each of these dots, it's one of one submission uh, on Kegel's website, I presume. Okay. And as you can see, there is been, there's been since 2015 a, a small but a, 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 an increase in the accuracy on ImageNet uh, that uh, progresses quite steadily, right? Uh, and this is the latest uh, one, but also note that there are many others that are pretty flat, right? <laughs> in comparison to 2015. So yeah, some of them are performing better, but most are not. Bringing me back to the earlier point that many of these algorithms just don't work for this data set, right? And some do, and then we all say, oh my gosh, we've improved so much because we've found one algorithm that does really well on that particular data set, right? Um, now, this algorithm, the latest one to win, uses uh, a network they call the efficient net. And um, the way this works is that you start with a relatively small network, and you train the network with the labeled data from ImageNet. Okay? Now, once you have done this, you use that network to label many more samples that don't have labels or that have not been labeled by humans. Um, while you do that, uh, there is another network, which is a much larger or a significantly larger network that we're going to call the student that uh, looks at this and learns from that first network, let's call it the teaching network. Okay and learns how to classify samples based on what that teacher is doing. Uh, because it's a larger network, it has more parameters and therefore can modify that manifold in my feature space in more ways and adapt better to the data. Once this student network has learned, you repeat the process by making the, t the student network the teacher and putting as a student an even larger network. And you keep iterating that process. Um, here's the algorithm in a pseudocode type of <laughs> uh, format. Uh, so you have your uh, model. Let's call it uh, this uh, model here with some parameters, which minimizes a cross entropy loss. They use a cross entropy loss that we have to design. This is your loss function that compares the true output with whatever the network does. Right? Uh, then, and you do that with noise um, to make it more robust. And then use an unnoised teacher model to generate a soft or hard pseudo labels of unlabeled images, right? So you label the images uh, that have not been labeled before. They call it pseudo labels because they are not true labels. Uh, and then the student network, right, the new model. Uh, there are the parameters theta, uh, theta, uh, well, just theta prime, uh, which minimize the cross entropy loss on labeled images and unlabeled images with the noise added uh, to the student network. And this is the equation, right? So the loss function on the true outputs versus the noise output of the network plus this regularizing term, okay? which is based on the unlabeled data that has now been labeled. Again, you iterate this process by making the student the teacher, and the algorithm keeps getting better. And you see here in the red um, line over here, right, that the first network does relatively well, the second network does better, the third network better, and so on, up to, say, about probably five, right, the fifth network, and then it starts to saturate, right? There's just very little space on how much these networks can grow or how much more they can learn. Um, but on this top one classification, they can get about 86% accuracy, 
which is uh, pretty reasonable. Okay. Still not there yet. Um, more limitations. I'm not going to talk about adversarial attacks, but let me um, describe you, to you what an adversarial attack is, because that's important. Again, I do cover this in the machine learning class, so if you haven't taken that, take a look. So here's how you can create an adversarial attack. Now remember that these networks you can do the forward, pa um, the forward pass that we described in our, our fourth or fifth lecture of this class, right? You have the forward path that just does the computations of the variable x with the corresponding weights of that node and the nonlinear activation function, right? Remember that? Okay, so it's the forward path. When you do that, you start with an image, you do a forward path, and you get probabilities at the outputs, right? If you use softmax, you get probabilities for each of the possible classes, and all the probabilities add to one, right? All right, what you could do, you could invert that process. You could start with the probabilities, and I'm going to say one for one of the outputs and zero everyone else, right? Whatever output I'm interested in, say a car. And then go backwards and see, optimize, what I'm trying now to optimize. So my optimization goes forward instead of backwards, right? <laughs> because I don't do back propagation, but forward propagation in that case. I optimize the image that is going to, or I try to find the image, excuse me, that optimizes that output I want. So train the network means that I have an input image X and I want an output, specific output Y. In this case, it's the opposite. I have an output Y and I want to find the X right, that actually maximizes that probability of an output. Now when you do that, the image that you're going to obtain is pretty much noise. Right? Meaning that this network hasn't really learned that category of an object, right? Just has learned some correlations, nonlinear correlations, very complex nonlinear correlations of the pixels in the image that defined in the images in your data set that particular category. But now what you do is you take, so if, let's say that we have done this for a car, right? Now you take an image of a banana, right? Take an image of a banana, and now you create a new image, which is the image of the banana, plus a small scalar, say 0.01 or 0.05, times that image that you have recovered for that, that maximizes the output of car, of probability of car. Right? So you combine these two, and now you put this new image, which to us looks exactly like the original image of a banana because it's a banana with a small number of noise points that are invisible to us. Um, you put that through the network and the network says car because those pixels are meant to maximize the output car. That's called an adversarial attack because there's an adversary who has just manipulated your input in a way to output exactly what they want. Right? Now, anyone sees a problem with this? Say, self-driving cars, where I can go to a specific sign, say a stop sign, put a small number of dots in that stop sign in a specific way that tells the network that this is a green traffic light and cause a large number of accidents? Well, people have done these things, right? People have come up with um, stickers that they put on them or on their face, right? And then all of a sudden, face recognition systems fail. They stop actually detecting that there is a face. They don't know that there is a face anymore. Or uh, putting some um, stickers on a stop signs and the system stops recognizing a stop sign. And People have shown, um, if actually even printed t-shirts that you could put on, it will just tell this, uh, an object recognition system that you are an ostrich or whatever you want, right? Anything. They've built um, uh, 
objects, actually physical objects with 3D printers that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a model of a car that is printed in a way that algorithms will say it's a bicycle or it's a person, right? Whatever you want, and that's very problematic. So these networks learn very complex statistics of the image that can be manipulated. Um, now, there is debate on how much these adversarial attacks are useful or not for an adversary, because typically you need access to the deep neural network to compute the adversarial attack. But people have come up with universal adversarial attacks or ways to do universal adversarial attacks as well. Okay. So again, I covered this in more detail in the machine learning course, but um, I think you have to be aware of that. So that's one of the problems. Now, in this year's CVPR, this was just a few months ago, uh, there was this paper that was very interesting. And they did something similar to adversarial attacks, but what they wanted to know is for the actual object, right? So let's say they want to recognize a school bus. School bus is my category that I want to recognize images of, right? And I want to know under which conditions I am not going to recognize a school bus. So I have a deep neural network that has been trained to recognize school buses. And it does this very well, apparently. But are there conditions or there, there are images that will not be recognized as a school bus? And the way they do this is exactly the same, right? So you have the network here. And now they want to construct an image with an actual background and a 2D projection of a 3D model of a school bus, OK? Now, when you do this projection, you use a camera model here, right? A 3D renderer means that you go from 3D to 2D, right? Classical camera model, as we've seen. Um, and then you optimize the parameters of this camera model based on this back propagation that I was talking about, right? So that you go from, I want to make a mistake, right? When I am not going to recognize this as school bus, what do I have to, which orientation of the bus do I have to have and which illumination do I have to have to trick the network that this is not a school bus. You see how this works? Everyone? And when you do that, that's what they find. This image, you see this top image here? The system says it's a school bus. This image, it says it's a garbage truck. This one, it's a punching bug, I mean, I don't know. See, this is a snow plow. I mean, I guess I can see that, this is a snow plow. <laughs> uh, this is for a motorcycle, right? So this is a motorcycle, fine. Uh, but this is a parachute? I'm sorry, what? Uh, and if you put the motorcycle like this, this is a bobsled, and this is another parachute, right? And this is uh, with a fire truck, and you see, right? A bobsled, a fire boat. Like, you're not confused. <laughs> Why are these networks confused about this? It just makes no sense, right? This is to show you the limitations of deep networks and deep learning, right? It's great. It's an amazing tool. But we still have a lot to learn before they can actually be deployed in the real world for serious applications. There are many applications where if this happens, nothing's going to happen, right? I mean, who cares? But there are other applications like self-driving cars where I would be very concerned <laughs> if my car is driven by uh, something that uh, thinks this is a bobsled like, with 79% probability. It just makes me shiver, right? And again, this is just published a few months ago. This is not something like, oh, we have already solved that, right? This is, um, this is uh, still a major problem. Um, and here are more examples, right? So uh, the cell phone, is recognized as an iPod, as a harmonica, a mouse, a microwave, a projector, a remote control. Uh, gee, these genes are recognized as a horizontal bar, whatever that means, parallel bar, balanced bean. Uh, I mean, uh, you, yeah, it's weird, right? This is recognized as a velvet, ski, ski mask, sock, uh, well, I guess there are socks somewhere. <laughs> Maybe that's what it means. So anyways, uh, this is. Uh, there was a paper in PNAS um, 
three years ago also that tested the accuracy of people for patches of images or images that are really small. Uh, and humans are really good at recognizing this. You know what this is. You know exactly what this is. You know exactly what this is. You know exactly what this is. Algorithms are absolutely terrible at this, right? Computer vision arms are absolutely terrible at this task, at this moment, uh, which makes it uh, really hard, right? I mean, you would not be confused about what this is. You would assume that it's something like this, right? But a computer can't. Um, there are people that are writing about this. Um, this is, again, not an exhaustive, or I haven't done an exhaustive search, or haven't made any attempt to give you a, uh, the most important uh, critiques of these deep neural networks. But these are just two that I'm aware of. Um, so Alan Yu, a good friend of mine, uh, has published a paper recently uh, deep nets, what have they ever done for vision? <laughs> uh, and he claims they've done a lot, right? I mean, let's not, it's like saying, what has Lisa Square, Lisa Squares ever done for vision, right? Yeah, a lot. Now, is Lisa Squares the solution? Probably not, right? It cannot solve all the problems. It cannot solve the hard problems. Is gradient descent or gradient ascent the solution? Well, not for everything. Doesn't mean that it's not useful, right? These are very, very useful tools. They solve very important problems for us, but they're not the solution for vision in general, right? Um, and this is a recent book uh, published by Gary Marcus um, on um, the future of AI and what needs to be done uh, to actually, or his view on what he thinks needs to be done to improve AI before we hit the next winter. Uh, um, uh, so, I mean, uh, in one way, you have to understand that computer vision, most of what we have covered, 99.9% right, .9 of what we've covered in computer vision is manifold learning, really, right? You either find a hyperplane or the manifold, right, the function that maps f of x onto y, right? And that's what we're doing. Now, the question is whether this is intelligence or not. Is that all our brain does? And maybe it is, we don't know. Maybe that's all our brains can do. Just do that simple computation. And if that's what our brains can do, then there have to be other things that are encoded in the genes, right? That give us enough knowledge about the world that allow us to find functional mappings like this that actually allows us to recognize objects and uh, learn languages and learn mathematics and take courses like computer vision, right? Um, maybe that's it, or maybe we're missing something. And if we are, we don't know what it is, right? Okay. All right. Um, I'll talk maybe in the last lecture about algebra topology if we get there. All right, so uh, let's see. Let's uh, switch to um, the next topic, and I'm going to try to cover this as much. Uh, I'm going to try to cover all of this today so we have time to talk about uh, very recent ideas and research on how to study these deep neural networks so that we can actually know why they work, when they work, and what can we do to make them better, right? Oh, yeah. Now, another thing that I believe you should be very aware of is that everything that you have learned, so now you have taken 5460, right, the introduction to image processing and computer vision, and this more advanced, advanced <laughs> computer vision course, and you have learned a lot of methods and ways, approaches to study vision and design computer vision systems, right? Now, what has happened since about 2014, 2013, 2014 was probably really when it really started kicking off, which was the CVPR that we organized here in Columbus. Until today, is that people have taken everything that has been done before, which is what we've covered in these two courses, 
and redo it with deep, le deep learning, right? So here's the algorithm. This is a very simple algorithm to generate new computer vision methods. You select one of the computer vision algorithms that we have presented in either our introductory course or in our advanced course. Just pick one, right? Structure from motion, pick one. Optical flow, whichever. Um, find or create a large data set of images for that problem. And then identify a deep neural network, right? Define a topology for a deep neural network that can be trained with gradient descent on that data set to solve that problem. And you have a new method. And that's been the last five years of research in computer vision. I mean, we've not only been doing that, but many people have been doing that. Just that, that has been most of the focus. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few examples here. And I'm going to start by shaming myself. This is work from my lab uh, that I've showed you before, right? So structure from motion is a classical way to recover 3D shape from a video sequence. Well, you can do that with deep neural networks, right? So here's what you do. You take videos of many people, right? And you use structure from motion to recover the 3D shape of the faces of that many people, right? And now you take the first image of the video sequence and the 3D shape reconstruction, and you use it as your input X and your output Y, and you train a deep neural network. And the deep neural network will find that manifold that maps a single 2D image into a 3D shape model of that image, right? That's it. That's a paper. That's how we publish papers these days. Uh, now, obviously, there is more to that, right? Uh, so for example, um, this is the classical list of squares or reconstruction laws that we've talked many times, right? Um, that works OK, but you can always define a loss function like this one here, uh, which it, what this uh, loss function that we proposed a few years ago does, for example, is that instead of comparing how good this is for, um, excuse me, this is for landmark detection, right? Landmarks on the face. Then instead of comparing this landmark detection with the ground truth, right? So Y with the output of your network, what it does, it compares the output of the distance, basically, between two outputs of the network and the distance between the true labels, right? The two locations. And because you can do that not just for two points, but for three points, uh, where you can compute the area uh, of, uh, of the triangle, right, of the simplex defined by these three points, but you can do that for four points and compute the area uh, inside that four points and so on, right? You can design loss functions that work better than the classical square loss or least of squares loss, right? Okay. So obviously there is more to what I said Defining these loss functions is important. But now we've turned into finding a, 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 an architecture for the deep neural network that we can train that works, and defining a loss function that is usually based on some of the methods that we have introduced before, right? With the same equations that we've introduced before that we can use in gradient descent to train those networks, right? To make them work. Okay. So this is you know, how well these algorithms work now with these networks. Right, they work great. <laughs> they work at a human precision. It's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, these are results for faces. You can do the same thing for body posts, right? So you can recognize landmark points on the face, but also on the body, right? And same approach, that's exactly the same that I said. You can reconstruct the pose in 3D, and this is from a single 2D image to a 3D reconstruction of the body pose with the exact same algorithm, trained with new data, right? Uh, this is an application in American Sign Language. We can actually now do recognition of American Sign Language with these algorithms. So these algorithms are very powerful, right? Because <laughs> they allow us to do everything that we were doing before, but um, just more, f well, a little better, right? <laughs> uh, here's another paper published in 2015 that uh, uh, what this does, it describes, um, remember that we have talked a lot about uh, shape analysis in this course and in 5460. And one of the main problems in shape analysis is that you have to have a shape space, 
right? And for object recognition, that shape of space ideally has to always have a continuum in, in the face space, excuse me, the shape of space, we have a continuum, right? So the vector on the uh, shape of space moves smoothly. That means that the object is deforming smoothly as well, right? So that's one characteristic. But the other characteristic is that objects that are defined the same category should be clustered together, and objects that define different categories should be farther apart, right? So this is what they did. They did this with deep neural networks, right? So they had these deep neural networks. It's usually called an encoder and a decoder. The encoder meaning that you're going from more nodes or more dimensions to less dimensions, and from less dimensions to more, right? And then you have objects like this that you see when they deform the way they, in the way that they show this uh, functions of the shape of space, right? This shape of space representations are basically the same, almost identical, but when you have different objects, they are different, right? And they deform uh, smoothly. Um, this is another deep shape representation uh, that was published actually in this CVPR this year, just a few months ago. And again, right, what they're trying to find here is something that varies smoothly in your shape space as the object deforms or changes smoothly in shape, right? But at the same time that you can define the boundaries of the object uh, as precisely and as accurately as possible. Um, Here's another interesting paper, uh, two, two years old, uh, how, to do, how to estimate the parameters of a camera from a single image. Now remember how much time we spent in 5460 defining algorithms to uh, recover the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters? This is for the extrinsic parameters only, okay? So the translation rotation. So basically, um, I take a picture with my cell phone of this view, right? And now I want, in this larger view, I want you to tell me where I was and how it was located, right? What is my translation and rotation, my extrinsic parameters of the camera, right? And the way they do this is by defining a loss function in a deep neural network that computes the quaternions, right? Now remember, the quaternions are nothing else than the description of the rotation, but in S2, right? So that you can have a vector that points uh, the rotation. So the rotation is described by a vector, right? An S of three, okay? And then the, uh, the problem is learning the geometric reprojection error, right? The reprojection, that means that you're mapping first from, th uh, that you're, map you're recovering from 2D to 3D, but then you're mapping from 3D to 2D, right? And you see how well you do. So remember that if you have X, Q, the quaternions, and G, which I forget exactly what it is now, you get the uh, image points UV, right? Um, and then here, as you see, you have the UVW, right? In homogeneous coordinates. You have K, the matrix of intrinsic parameters, R, the rotation, and X, uh, the translation, right? And then you compute your equations and you define this loss function that you want to minimize uh, with training data. You need training data, right? That's the point. Uh, with deep learning, you always need tons of learning data. But you can actually estimate the extrinsic parameters at least with that approach. And then from a single image again, and that's the power of deep learning, really. You can do things like this. Remember in 5460, we needed ma many, many images, right? Or we needed to put uh, labels in the real world or a calibration grid. And here with just one single image after it's trained, you can find the extrinsic parameters. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, and these are some results, right? So this is the original image. Now, once they have the extrinsic parameters, they can reconstruct the, of this object in 3D, as we did, right, with the methods that we have described before. And now they, then they reproject this in, onto the image. You see the reprojection onto the image here. And then it's pretty accurate, right? It's not perfect, but it's pretty accurate. And this is the, rec the reconstruction error that they want to uh, minimize, right? That's the loss function. And the loss function is based on the extrinsic parameters that they have computed. And here's another reconstruction and another reprojection error and so on, right? So you get the idea. That's pretty cool. 
Um, stereo vision. You can do stereo. Remember stereo also from 5460? You can do stereo with deep networks, right? Same thing. Why not? Um, here are some results as well. Um, optical flow. Why not? <laughs> you can do optical flow with deep neural networks. Of course you can. Uh, so this is uh, from 2013. Uh, so you have the reference image and the target image, right? And then you have all these four by four patches, right? Uh, they're usually described as sift patches, right? So you want to find the patches that maximize the sift similarity, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to move these patches around. You see how they are moved to match the, uh, the reference image, okay? And that allows you to have images that are pretty far away or pretty far apart in similarity, in pixel similarity. Because remember, one of the problems with optical flow is that every consecutive image has to be very similar to the previous one, right? In this way, you can train the system to actually work even when the images are not that similar to each other, right? They have the same scene, but maybe one is frontal view, the other one is 45 degree view. Right? There's a huge difference in pixel similarity. But then you train the network to adapt using SIFT descriptors uh, to adapt these uh, areas and then compute the optical flow from training data. Right? Um, this is another flow net. This is from 2015 uh, to compute optical flow. Um, just, you know, this is the architecture and you can read, I mean, all these things, basically the loss function is going to be the loss function of the optical flow, right? With small modifications or the reconstruction error, the square loss, right? Based on some training, uh, excuse me, yeah, some training data that has been labeled. Um, and then some architecture, and this is the architectures that they developed. Um, and here um, they propose a specific type of uh, structure that is interesting and I'm running out of time so I want to go fast but this is uh, the ground truth data and this is their estimate right and this is the ground truth data and this is their estimate which is not too bad uh, right from optical flow. oh this is oh and this is their estimate with this additional term that's right which looks even better right much better Um, more examples. Uh, so you see here that there are these uh, two frames overlapped with one another that define the optical flow. This is the ground truth, and these are the different estimates with different networks. Okay. Action recognition. Unfortunately, we have not had much time. Uh, we have not had time to talk about action recognition. Um, I had a lecture prepared on that, but we'll have to wait uh, for another time. Um, we'll post it at some point. <laughs> um, but basically, you can design also networks to do action recognition other than using the classical approaches that uh, we have defined. And then here, for example, what this shows is that you can compute the motion of specific landmark points on the uh, object of interest, and then across time, you can link this into a function, right? A trajectory of landmark points as they move and use that for, um, to feed a, so the spatial temporal uh, stream would detect these different landmark points and the temporal would define this type of optical flow, right? Uh, that is used to recognize the action, right? Um, Semantic segmentation. Remember that we talked about segmentation uh, in one of our lectures, uh, and I talked about HROS convolutions at the time. Remember that? There's a specific type of convolution that I mentioned. Um, well, this is based on a deep neural network that uses this uh, convolutions as the convolutional layer, and this is the HROS convolution that we have defined before. And then you have, um, after this convolution, you get this map. And on this map, you use a fully connected CRF uh, type of graph, right? That I also cover in detail in the machine learning course. Well, not in detail, but in some more detail. <laughs> uh, 
And, uh, but I do talk about random, Markov random fields in more detail uh, that I, uh, here we don't have time. Uh, and conditional uh, random fields, obviously, a Markov random fields. And then uh, you train that uh, graph um, to output this uh, semantic segmentation. By semantic segmentation, which is meant is that not only you provide the segmentation of each of the objects, but what, that you actually know what each of the objects is. Okay? Um, this is, again, pay me paper just a couple of years ago. And here are some results of the semantic segmentation. So you see an error liner that has been outlined, uh, a motorcycle and two people that have been identified, the bicycles and the cyclists have been identified, and so on, right? You get the idea. Another semantic segmentation, uh, on, that's another PAMI paper, uh, uses an encoder decoder type of approach. Um, more results. Uh, this is actually semantic segmentation these days is used very, very, very commonly in self driving cars because you want to identify, you know, what's road, what, is, what are buildings, what are cyclists, what are people walking, what are other cars. So you'll see this um, applied many times in um, scenes like this that are useful for self driving cars. And, and note the difference between semantic segmentation working in a very complex image like this, but an indoor scene of furniture versus an outdoor scene like this, right? That is much less structured because trees and, and buildings and people are not usually as well structured as just furniture, right? So it makes the problem much more difficult. All right. Do you remember BRDFs, right? Reflectance maps um, from 5460. Well, you can also use a deep neural network to train that, right? So here's a CVPR from 2016. And um, remember that you, want, you have that hemisphere, right? That can be represented with a ball like this. And this is the BRDF, right? The reflectance map uh, for each of these uh, three different objects, right? So this is the real image. These are the BRDFs, right? And then what you can do is when you have estimated the reflectance map, you can switch them, right? So apply this one to this, the reflectance map of this card to this one, and then you get this. Right? And you apply this one to this one, and you get this, and this one to this one, you get this, right? You can play with these things. And we have, we know which are the equations to estimate the BRDF, and remember that they're very hard. Right? They're nonlinear equations, very hard to estimate. Well, if you have enough training data, you can train a deep neural network like this to do the job for you, right? And you can solve a lot of problems. Um, uh, here are the networks again, and type of encoder, decoder, uh, reconstruction of the reflectance maps, and the normals, right? You can train another one to recover the normals. Remember sh shape from shading, right? So. In shape from shading, we want to recover the shading, obviously, and the shape, the normals, right? And you can do that with these neural networks as well, right? So you recover not only the reflectance, the direction, the indirect, uh, the uh, sparse RM, I don't know what it is, but the normals as well, which is the shape of the object, okay? So you have the same decomposition that we have talked about but now you can do it with um, these deep networks. All right, any questions? No? All right, I'll see you next week then.